all of Spiked's articles, podcasts, and essays are free, and we want to keep it that way. But to do so, we ask our loyal supporters, if they can afford it, to chip in, ideally with a regular donation. It might not sound like much, but donating as little as £5 per month can have a transformative impact on our work. For less than the cost of two copies of The Guardian, you can help Spike to become bigger, better and bolshier than ever. So if you like our work and want to support us, please do consider signing up. Just go to spiked-online.com and hit the big red donate button in the top right corner. Thanks, and now on with the show. Hello, and welcome to the Spiked podcast. I'm Fraser Myers, and joining me as ever this week, we have Spiked's deputy editor, Tom Slater. Hello. And Spiked columnist, Ella Whelan. Hi. Coming up on the show, the Dominic Cummings scandal, the crisis in the EU, and Joe Biden's You Ain't Black gaffe. Dominic Cummings broke the rules. The country can see that, and it's shocked the government cannot. Did you go to Barnard Castle, Mr Cummings? Durham Consabbery concluded there might have been a minor breach of the regulations. I do regret the confusion and the anger and the pain that people feel. One rule for you, one rule for everyone else. The country wants to see you gone now. No, I don't, I don't regret what I did. On late Friday evening, The Mirror and The Guardian reported that Dominic Cummings, chief advisor to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, had been spoken to by police, allegedly for breaking the lockdown. He had driven 260 miles from London to Durham with his family, while allegedly infected with coronavirus. The same papers later claimed that he made a second visit to Durham. The row has rumbled on ever since, with the PM under enormous pressure to sack him. Cummings even gave an unprecedented press conference on the matter on Bank Holiday Monday, where he attempted to rebut the accusations. On Thursday, Durham police confirmed that there might have been a minor breach of the lockdown rules when he went for a 30-minute drive to Barnard Castle with his wife and child. The police say they have no intention of taking action. Sam, what are your thoughts about this? I think it's ridiculous. We're now in the sixth day talking about this. And when you think all that's going on in the world, all that's going on in our society right now, you know, the 10th week of a three-week lockdown, an economy in free fall, carnage in the care home sector. We've been talking endlessly about a drive to Barnard Castle. And I think the ridiculousness of it, I think, really needs to be pointed out. Now, of course, when the allegations first came out, they sounded a lot more explosive. You know, this idea that he'd just gone to visit his parents whilst being symptomatic to stay in their home. This idea, as reported in the original Mirror story, that he'd been investigated by the police, them saying quite definitively that he'd broken the rules, the paper that is, not the police themselves. But as the course of the week has gone on, a lot of that has just started to fall away. You know, we found out that the police didn't visit him to investigate him. They were just advising on other matters. This follow-up allegation that he'd actually gone back to Durham after he'd returned to London fell through. Um, We've now obviously had this statement from Durham police saying that even though him driving up to Durham to self-isolate with coronavirus, him and his family, was legal, potentially the Barnard Castle bit wasn't. I mean, it's just the the kind of totality of it. I think it's completely withered away. And I think we've got to make a bit of a distinction here between did Dominic Cummings probably interpret the rules in a broader sense than other people? In that sense, was he not holding himself to a higher standard? Potentially. But at the same time, I think that pales in comparison to the ridiculous kind of outsized reaction that we've seen to it. And the reason this story has been sustained over days and days and days is because you had, you know, journalists who got it wrong in the first place, frankly, and then dug their heels in. You've had a lot of commentators and politicians who had pre-existing beefs with this man for a mix of personal and political reasons. And you've had this kind of accompanying hysteria that they've whipped up, even to the point where there's now protests outside this man's house. And it just feels like that response, that reaction that media kind of self-obsession almost, because they seem to get more and more angry the more and more they weren't getting their way and weren't getting their scalp, is far worse than anything that we know definitively that Dominic Cummings has done at this point. I can understand why people are angry, not least because of the fact that the government, I think, never really stressed the nuance that existed even within their very draconian guidelines. But at the same time, when you look at the Cummings derangement syndrome, as um, Brendan O'Neill called it on Spike this week, that's a far more serious problem than, as I say, this one advisor's 30-minute drive to Barnard Castle. Ella? That this is just simply about fairness in the lockdown debate. I believe that as much as I believe that someone went for a drive to Barnard Castle to test their eyesight. I mean, this to me, you don't believe that. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> he's obviously not a very good driver, but the, it's obvious that this is you know, in large part about the fact that Dominic Cummings is a particular hate figure, um, certainly among many of the Remain-centric 
media. I mean, it's not controversial to say that people don't like the guy, but I think the reason why there has been anger is as Tom says that it seems like there is one rule for government advisors and another rule for the rest of us. But I mean, if you didn't know that by now, have you been living under a rock? I mean, the the <laughs> thing that's frustrated me the most is that it's quite obvious what's happened, that he has, you know, interpreted the rules a certain way, bent the stick, however much sympathy you have for the guy dealing with a sick child and a vomiting wife and all those kind of gory details that we had laid out to us in the Rose Garden in that absolutely bizarre press conference let's you know move on it's the most non story to me what is the actual story is what no one really wants to pick up on in the media is that this is sort of fantastic evidence that us all living in fear and terror and dread for 8 weeks thinking that if we leave our houses people are going to die as the government has repeatedly told us with those alarmist stay home messages you know literally the nhs will overrun and dead bodies will stack up if you go to the shop more than once in a day that all of that was hype and actually worse than that it wasn't just hype it was a strategy because the government hasn't trusted the public with the ability to make the kind of judgments it trusts its government aides to make. So the reason why no one wants to talk about that is, of course, the response to the Cummings affair has been journalists panicking, saying this is going to cause a public health nightmare. Mm. Everyone's going to go start going out and having street parties. Can't you understand that this threatens people's lives? And it's the same thing. It's this. It's treating the public like we are just a bunch of idiots who can't make any judgments, who can't be trusted with any kind of information. Actually, we're just children that should be kept indoors. And so there's alarmism on both sides. And all of the rest of us at home are watching this thinking, I think I could quite confidently say most of us have at some point, to some degree, bent the rules on this lockdown, whether that means going back out to the shop because you forgot milk or whether that means accidentally on purpose bumping into your mum for a quick chat on the street. But we all have taken this very seriously. And in the round, poll after poll shows and all the data on transport being down, that we have taken it seriously and we have stayed indoors. So what's the story here that some guy went on a drive and is you know a particularly unpleasant character, or that, as someone put it uh, this week, we've all been had for fools, and I think it's probably the latter. It's important to draw out the fact that he, you know, Cummings was in favour of the lockdown, mm. and so it is kind of similar to the Neil Ferguson story that we were talking about a few weeks ago, where clearly these you know purveyors of doom don't quite believe their own hype because you know they don't think that there is that much danger in making exceptions for themselves. I think one of the key things is, is worth just reiterating is just how out of proportion the response has been. I mean, it really has been completely unhinged. And you know mm. that the response has gone too far when it involves bishops of the Church of England and police and, you know, not just the usual kind of um, media characters. I mean, you do have to ask sometimes when you heard bishops calling for you know, the repentance of Cummings and Boris Johnson, you know, what century were we living in? You know, it did <laughs> give kind of extra ammunition to the idea that this is, you know, a bit of a witch hunt if we do have these kind of religious figures stirring up trouble. Mm. Tom, do you have any thoughts? Well, I think just going back to the media part of this for a second, because I guess the second part of this story, at least in the last couple of days, um, has been the Emily Maitlis scandal or non-scandal, depending on how you look at it, where she, on news night a couple of nights ago, launched into this diatribe against Dominic Cummings and the government basically pronounced him guilty, even though that's a matter for a judge, not her, and even got in some sly digs at him, you know, saying that this supposed man of the people who would lazily label anyone who disagreed with him as elite is now out of step with public opinion. There was a, obviously a huge backlash, a lot of complaints were made because it so obviously breached, you know, impartiality guidelines that the BBC has. And they actually upheld the complaint um, in a slightly mealy mouthed way. And Almost what was more striking was not the fact that Maitlis launched into this in the first place. She's got a bit of form in that regard. But the fact that you then saw this amazing response to this on on the internet, basically the kind of FBPE set, the kind of Remainer commentariat, 
acting as if we were now being plunged into kind of Putinist authoritarianism. <laughs> hmm. That people who dared to speak the truth were being, you know, somehow punished by these big institutions. It was so fascinating. And it just kind of really caught home that, first of all, the hysteria on this question has really reached fever pitch. You know, the Dominic Cummings stuff, they've almost worked themselves up into a kind of lather about all this stuff. It's kind of self sustaining at this point. But I think it's also been interesting where the very same people who for years have been banging on about populism and post truth, they genuinely don't seem to recognize the distinction between facts and opinions. They genuinely seem to think that because they are right and, you know, the arc of history bends towards justice and therefore them, that basically what they say is truth without even necessarily having to grant it. In fact, I thought was really, really remarkable. And the way that Emily Maitlis has now been turned into kind of like the sort of Princess Diana of this lot, um, (laughs) I thought was an absurd spectacle, but but a revealing one at the same time. Ella? It was also embarrassing that there was huge outcry about the fact that she had been banned from Newsnight reprimands and taken off air. And actually, she and a colleague had to come on and correct everyone who was defending them and say, no, I haven't been taken off air. Someone's just stood in for me. Uh, there was a huge amount of press freedom supporters last night who, have, from people who I've never seen give, you know, a toss about press freedom in their lives. <laughs> but it's raised interesting questions about the role of the media in all of this, because I've been thinking for a long time, just you take a step back and you realise how odd it is that the only interaction we have with politics, you know, us ordinary people at home at the moment, is through watching these press conferences. And yes, a, a lucky one of us on occasion gets to zoom in and ask whatever cabinet minister is up there a question. But mainly our political interaction at the moment is through journalists. And so I think it's given them this weird kind of sense of superiority or importance that I think they, they're mm. no longer simply reporting the news, commentating, they are representing us in those press conferences. And that's a problem because the questions they're asking show how out of step they are with the rest of the country. Because rather than asking the questions that need to be asked about the crucial things that Tom has already mentioned, like the scandal in care homes, like this new track and trace app, like the issue of vaccine, we were all talking about that for a while, now it's gone away. And when the lockdown's going to end, They've decided that Cummings is the thing that we should be obsessed with and whether or not him and his son, you know, emitted bodily fluids on the side of a road and whether or not that was in line with government (laughs) guidelines. And it's incredibly frustrating to be watching that at home because you just end up screaming at the television. You're listening to The Spike Podcast. Spiked has no subscriptions and no paywalls. All of our content is free. We rely on the generosity of our listeners and readers to keep us going and growing. For those of you who already donate to Spiked, we can't thank you enough. It really means a lot to the team. If you haven't already, then why not consider giving Spiked a donation? You can make a one-off payment or give monthly by going to spiked-online.com. The EU is facing the largest economic crisis in its history. As the Covid crisis first began to ravage Italy, the EU struggled to offer a unified, coherent response. Earlier this month, Chancellor Merkel and President Macron launched a proposal for a 500 billion euro recovery fund. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has turned that into a 750 billion euro fund financed by joint EU borrowing. This move has been widely lauded by pro-Europeans as a historic step for EU integration. But also in the past few months, the German courts have caused a lot of trouble for the European Central Bank, questioning the legality of its quantitative easing programme. This could also have major implications for the EU's ability to steer Europe's recovery. To find out more about the current crisis, I spoke to Ashoka Modi, visiting professor of international economics at Princeton University and author of Euro Tragedy, a drama in nine acts. I wondered if we could just start by talking a bit about how bad the economic crisis in the European Union and in in the Eurozone is in relation to, particularly, you know, during the coronavirus pandemic. We know that in the first half of 2020, the Italian economy will contract by about 
I think that that is for now pretty much data rather than a guess. And the big question is going to be how much more it will deteriorate in the, in the rest of the year. So as a benchmark, I would say that the United States, despite all the fumbling it has done on the management of the health crisis, is probably going to contract less than any of the European countries. And the European countries have, have a set of additional problems, which are number one, that they trade a lot more than America does. And what we are seeing right now is that this crisis has affected pretty much every country around the world. And so when, when trading partners also do not function at sort of normal operating capacity, then they weigh each other down. They, they import less from each other, uh, which weighs down each other's exports. Second uh, reason why Europe is more weighed down is that it comes into this crisis with a larger debt burden. Now, in the, in Germany, the government itself does not have a large debt burden, but companies do. But for the rest of Europe, even the government debt burdens are extraordinarily high and household debt levels are also high. And the third reason why Europe is in greater difficulty is that European banks are much more fragile. And so these three factors are relevant, both in terms of thinking about how deep the crisis will be and what the recovery will look like. So altogether, my view is that Europe is worse off than the United States. And within Europe, Italy and probably Spain are worse off than the others. What I'm also noticing is that France is doing rather poorly. We have sort of pretty much the sort of major countries in the south of Europe are going to face an economic shock that is both deep and potentially long lasting. And what does the economic shock in Italy, you know, mean for other European countries? Is the is there a danger that if things spiraled out of control in Italy, would there be a serious contagion? It depends now a, a great deal on what the uh, policy response is going to be. So again, this is a moment of hope because the uh, somewhat frightening uh, judgment of the German court on the limits of ECB operations. That judgment has been dismissed by most commentators as not having any teeth. And there is this proposal for the European Commission to borrow and give grants. My concern is twofold on that front. Number one, that starting with the plan for grants, Italy is wounded now. Spain is wounded now. This is like promising a band-aid to someone in six months' time. So the wound has to be repaired now. Otherwise, the bleeding will cause a lot of both humanitarian distress as well as economic distress. Italy is in particular in a weak situation because Italy comes into this crisis already a country that has not grown for 20 years. And the idea that it might get some grant money in six months time is no consolation because Italy needs probably something like 10 or 15% of GDP stimulus now. Remember again, just again, benchmarking against the United States, the US is going to do a fiscal stimulus in that range, a much stronger economy, less impact of COVID. So if, if the US needs that huge stimulus, then it certainly needs a stimulus of that order of magnitude. The bottom line is going to be in preventing contagion in Europe, how active the European Central Bank will be. And you've said that the judgment is going to be ignored, but a lot of people are concerned that the German courts have hobbled the ability of the ECB to act. 
in ruling past uh, quantitative easing illegal. But you don't you don't think that judgment is cause for concern in your view? I think that many commentators, particularly those who style themselves as pro-Europeans, have been too too quick to dismiss the German court's decision for two reasons. Number one, they have they have sort of ridiculed its economic analysis, which I think is somewhat misplaced because. In the end, the court is asking one basic question, which is that if Europe or the Eurozone has to have a a unified monetary policy, how far can it go to supporting the monetary and fiscal interests of one individual member country? That, that, That is the central question. In other words, monetary policy for the Eurozone is one matter, Monetary policy for Italy or for Spain is another matter. And the central question then translated into operational terms is what share of Italian bonds can the European Central Bank buy before it becomes legally and even more so politically unacceptable? Before we went into this crisis, The ECB, through its prior quantitative easing purchases, already owned about 23% of Italian sovereign debt. Now, we can expect that through the course of this crisis, through the course of the next six to nine months, if the ECB is going to have a material impact on sustaining Italy, it will need to buy another 20% of Italian debt which means that by the end of the year, it's entirely possible that the ECB will hold something in the range of 40 to 45% of Italian debt. At that point, the ECB effectively owns Italy. Remember, the ECB is not a normal central bank. The ECB is the central bank of a confederation of states. It's It's not a central bank for a nation state. As a consequence, what will happen is that the Italians will owe money indirectly to Germans through what are called the target two balances. Every time a foreigner like you or me sells an Italian bond, takes the money out of Italy, puts it into a German bank, in effect, that money now is owed through the ECB to the Germans. And the Germans keep a very watchful eye on that number because they know that if it, if at any point the Italians default on that debt, then either the ECB itself will need to repay that debt on behalf of Italy or the Italians will default. And the political question that will then arise, which is what the German court is essentially at its core asking, what will then happen to the claims of other member states? And I think that that question is an unanswered question, for which reason dismissing the German court is way too premature, because either as a legal question or as a political question, it's very likely to reappear before the year is out. And do you think that the EU is in some ways trying to downplay or deny the political fault lines here? I always come back to this one anchor, which is that the EU is a confederation of states. And in Mm. a confederation of states, each nation will act in its self-interest. And the idea that there is some notion of solidarity and or European sovereignty and or political camaraderie. These are all very good and lovely phrases, but they do not have any operational content. I find that a number of my uh, pro-European friends are now pointing the finger at the Dutch and others who are protesting against this bond. They're describing them as miserly, stingy. I think that these this sort of name-calling is first of all unbecoming, but it's completely beside the point because the notion of what constitutes solidarity has to be embedded in a social contract. And there is no social contract. In fact, the social contract is the opposite. For which reason? 
I remain very pessimistic, even though today there is a great deal of optimism that this latest bond initiative that Merkel and Macron have announced. Not only do we now know for certain that it'll come too late, but even when it does, whether it will in fact have any meaningful quantitative impact. You're listening to The Spiked Podcast. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher and more. And if your provider allows you to, why not give us a rating and a review while you're there? It really helps new listeners find the show. Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee, made an extraordinary gaffe last week. He told listeners of The Breakfast Club that if you've got a problem figuring out if you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. The backlash came from all sides. Even some of Biden's defenders admitted it made them cringe. But was this just a gaffe or did it tell us something more about politics? Ella, what are your thoughts? Yes, it is cringy. And there's a politicians, especially politicians of a certain age, do this all the time when they sort of attempt to get down with the kids. And we've seen it before with especially American politicians trying to play to the black vote or the Latino vote or, you know, putting on different personalities to try and court voters. And it never works. But the important thing that Andrew Doyle wrote in his column for Spiked this week was that this goes beyond simply a sort of ham-fisted attempt to seem cool or with it. Because actually what this reveals is the larger issue of there being this problem with particularly liberals believing that, you know, if you are black or Latina or a woman or basically anyone who isn't a straight white male, you should be voting for the person who isn't Trump. So in that sense, actually, he wasn't making a joke because there is this larger political viewpoint that says that all black people should be voting for Democrats because Trump is a racist and because the Republicans are racist. And what Andrew brings out in his article is the fact that this is an incredibly reductive way to treat black people like a homogenous blob and generalize people's political viewpoints. A similar thing happens with women and feminism. I mean, this was one of Hillary Clinton's huge downfalls when she ran for president in 2016, was she did this whole kind of I'm playing the woman card thing. And she repeatedly said things like, I just don't understand when women say they're not feminists, you know, of course, every woman is a feminist. And it's that kind of presumption that because of someone's identity, they have to vote a certain way, think a certain way, have a particular solidarity with people who share their identity that really puts people off and it makes people very angry, understandably so. The other point that Andrew makes, which is crucial, is that this is such a gift to Trump and the Trump campaign. In fact, I think they've turned the slogan into <laughs> merchandise and put it on a t-shirt because it's exactly this kind of crap woke politics that is, you know, Never mind any other argument that Trump has. If he only runs on the idea that the Democrats are woke idiots, then he's got his vote. It's it's brilliant for him. So this is a real own goal for Biden. I should say, you know, there's definitely a lot of fake outrage from the Trump camp, you know, with those T-shirts and things like that. And Nikki Haley, you know, Trump's former UN ambassador saying... You know, she said, I've struggled with Biden's recent remarks. They were gut-wrenchingly condescending. And, you know, well, she's right. But then look at all the stuff that Trump has said. You know, it's very hard to play the offence card. But I think you're also right, Ella, in the sense that it reveals the the kind of broader truth about the Democrats and that the Democratic elite has become completely imbibed in this woke politics. And, you know, throughout the primaries, what was interesting, you know, when the public were having their say, we saw that it was always the woke candidates who were the weakest, you know. So some mm-hmm. of the early ones that went out, you think of Kirsten Gillibrand, who promised to reach out to white women in the suburbs who voted for Trump and to explain to them what white privilege is and why they should switch their vote. You know, you had Kamala Harris um, arguing for reparations for slavery. You had Elizabeth Warren, who wanted a nine-year-old trans child 
to be there to approve her candidate for education secretary. I mean, all of these campaigns, you know, it seems obvious now that they would end in in disaster. But even people like Bernie Sanders, who had, you know, stood up to a lot of wokeness in 2016, had changed his 2020 campaign to incorporate those kind of views. Joe Biden looked as if he was not paying attention to any of that. But, you know, this latest gaffe seems to show that, you know, even he has imbibed it, even through his kind of broader incoherence, um, Mm. the identity politics shines through. Tom, your thoughts? Yeah, I thought the comment was really interesting. In a way, it was kind of like the mirror image of the basket of deplorables comment that Hillary Clinton made in 2016, talking about half of Trump voters of what she would call the basket of deplorables. And really that being interpreted, and I think rightly so, as a kind of blast against a lot of white working class voters, a lot of the people who are moving towards Trump, a lot of the people the Democrats used to be able to count on, that kind of signal that we don't need you anymore. And this you ain't black comment speaking to the criticism levelled at the Democrats, often by African American voters themselves, that they take them for granted, you know, and Mm. this kind of calculation that the Democrats have been working on for such a long time, which is this idea that the demographic shifts are such that we can abandon parts of our old base and just shore it up in other areas that we don't really need to worry that you can kind of play appealing to the electorate as a way of kind of stacking up different racial and age and gender blocks rather than actually trying to appeal to people across the board. And what's really interesting was that I think in many respects, as Ella was saying, the Hillary Clinton campaign was the kind of nadir of all of this or the peak of all of this. And yet not only did she lose, but she actually went backwards amongst many of those communities she thought were a lock for her. You know, she got 5% Mm. less of the African-American vote as opposed to 2012, 7% less than 2008 when Barack Obama first got into office. Trump even increased the Republican vote share amongst Latino voters at the election, despite the wall and everything else, which didn't necessarily suggest that people were revolting against the Democratic Party. When looking at who was, you know, the other option, it's quite clear that many of them still stayed put. Um, but nevertheless, I think speaking to that level of complacency and that level of wanting to play this kind of game, which is really divisive and uh, off-putting to many people. I think the other thing, just picking up on your point about why Biden is still playing this, Um, Now, obviously, the Democratic Party has been pulled to the left, in inverted commas, on a lot of these identity issues. I don't think they are particularly left-wing to be super woke, but anyway, just taking that as a given. But nevertheless, what I think was quite striking, you saw this with the Hillary Clinton campaign as well, is how readily incredibly centrist, technocratic type candidates can really embrace what seems like a quite extreme form of identity politics. Mm. And I think part of the reason is because it kind of costs them nothing. You don't really have to reckon with, say, the economic circumstances which confront a lot of these communities which are disproportionately working class you don't really necessarily have to pledge anything all you have to do is kind of say that you see them that you feel their pain that you're going to have a you know a female black running mate as biden was put under pressure to do so in that particular interview it's all about these kinds of far more kind of airy and insubstantial identitarian kind of talking points rather than anything genuinely substantial and genuinely transformative. So I think one of the reasons why you do see these quite milquetoast centrist Democrats so naturally drift over to this kind of rhetoric is because even though they don't realise it's like a electoral hemlock and a terrible idea, it's just so easy. It costs them nothing. Yeah, <laughs> um, And I think that's part of the reason you see so many of them embrace it so readily. And of course, while it costs nothing to go along with this stuff, it actually can appear to cost a great deal, you know, if you go against it, because the reaction from the press to anyone who goes against identity politics is extremely hostile, even if the general public are not particularly bothered and are probably quite supportive of any pushbacks against identity politics. Ella, have you got any final thoughts? It's all so fake. That's part of the problem. With an individual like Joe Biden, you know, straight white male in his 70s. It's not going to work playing this game. But he's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. If he doesn't say anything, you know, the media will say that he's not in tune with these identity groups and he'll get a hounding that way. And if he does try and do it, it's inevitably not going to work. Bernie Sanders just about almost pulled it off because he had this kind of cool old Jewish guy thing going for him. So it sort of worked. But with Biden, it doesn't at all. It's not his selling point. And so he's <laughs> damned if he does. And the important thing is this is all a show that's being played out for the benefit of essentially the chattering class in America, because the vast swathes of voters who are watching this will cringe at what Biden did. But more importantly, they'll be looking at the events that are happening in America at the moment, this enormous row that's happening about the individual George Floyd, who was killed by a police officer being kneeled on his neck and discussions about race, very, very 
heightened and tense discussions about race that are happening at the moment and say, well, what is it that you are actually going to do for the black community, Joe Biden? Never mind what you think about this ridiculous identity politics discussion. And so I just wish that they would stop playing to the media crowd and actually start talking about, as Tom says, the real policies, the real kind of change that you'd make in America. And let's face it, it's a country that needs some very drastic change, not least because it's going to have an enormous economic downturn after this lockdown. So these kind of fake, ridiculous discussions about identity politics do these politicians no favours. You've been listening to The Spike Podcast. For more Spike content, don't forget to keep visiting us at spiked-online.com, where you can also make a donation or treat yourself to something from our shop.